In this lesson, we will continue our discussion on list. We will see how we can use the list as function arguments, input argument or the output argument. I will start by defining a function for an integer as input argument. The function name is times 3 and the input argument n is an integer. As output, I want to return 3 times input integer. In main program, I can have a variable x equal to 6 and then I can apply this function on this variable x. We know the result will be 18. Now what if instead of x equal to 6 in the main program, if I change that x to some list. Now can I apply the same function on the list object. The function is returning input asterisk 3 and the asterisk operation is defined for the list as well. So if we run the code, you can see as the output we have a bigger list having the elements repeated 3 times. So basically there is nothing special to do if you want to use a list as input argument or the output argument. There is a term known as duck typing. What it means is that if an object walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, then it is a duck. This sounds a bit weird or funny, but what it means is that it really doesn't matter what an object is. What matters is that the object can behave like that or not. This is usually explained in context to object oriented programming, but we can explain it with this simple example as well. Here the function was supposed originally defined for an integer object, but any other object which can behave like that, meaning the static operation is defined for that, then we can apply this function on that object. So we really don't need to do anything special to use a list as function input argument or the output argument. All we need to ensure is that the logic applied on the list object is legal. So let's do some practice. Suppose I have a list of numeric values in the main program. I want to calculate the sum of squares of all values inside that list and I want to do it by creating a function. So let's create a function named as square sum. The input argument is a and in the main program I will apply a list as the input argument. So inside the function I can iterate over the elements of the list a. I should have a sum variable and I should add the squares of the elements into the sum variable. And finally I should return the sum variable. Now let's apply this function on list x in the main program. And you can see the output is 131. Now let's add one more element in the list as 10. The square of 10 is 100. So if previously the answer was 131, now it should be 231. Now let's do another task. Now instead of the sum of the squares of the elements of the list, I want to have another list such that all elements in that list are the squares of the elements of the list x. I can write that as the comment that I want to generate this list. Again we will do it by creating a user defined function and this time the input argument of the function will be a list and the output argument will also be a list. I will change the previous function. Let's name it like square it. The input argument a will be the list when this function will be used in the main program. And now I want to have another list as the output argument of this function. So I can simply start with an empty list. Then I will iterate all elements of the input argument list and I will append the square of that element into the list b. And finally outside the for loop, I will return the list b. Let's verify that in the main program. And you can see we have the desired result. Now let's see the lab manual. Here is the task which was the review question of the last lesson. But now we will do it using the user defined function. The task says that you have to take the numeric values from the user. Previously we said that when user will enter minus 1, we will end the process. But then I thought that minus 1 is also a numeric value. So maybe user wants to enter a minus 1. So we will consider this as well. And this time when user will enter a blank, meaning he will simply press the enter key without entering anything, that would indicate that he has done entering the numbers. So when the numbers are entered by the user, we have to generate and display three lists. The first list is the list of the numbers which are less than the average of the numbers entered by the user. And then the second list will be the list of the values which are equal to the average values entered by the user. We might not have any of those values, but if there is any, it should be displayed. Then the third list will be the list of the numbers which are greater than the average value of the entered numbers. So in main program we will take the numbers from the user and then we will call a function on that entered list and that function should return the three desired list. So the function would have three output arguments and all three will be the list. Let's first take the input values from the user in the main program. I will start with the empty list. 
Now I want to take numbers from the user, but instead of taking those as int or float, I will take those as string because we have to see if user has entered a blank or not, and that blank is basically a blank string. So I can have a while loop over here with the condition that entered value is not a blank string. Then I should append that into the list A, but after converting that into a float value, otherwise that would be a string value. So these two lines will keep executing until user enters a blank string. Let's first verify that. I am entering different values. Now I will press the enter key without entering anything and you can see the values entered inside this list. Now let's write the function. The input argument of this function will be a list. Now firstly I should calculate the average of those numbers inside the list. Then to generate three lists, I can start with three blank lists. L is for the list having the elements less than the average value. M is the list having the values equal to the mean value. And G is the list having the values greater than the mean value. Now I will iterate over the elements inside the list X. If that element is less than the average value, I should append that inside the list L. If that is equal to the average value, I should append that inside the list M. And finally the last else means the value of course will be greater than the mean value so I should append that into the list G. So you can see the values inside the list X are iterated and here we are appending that into the corresponding list. Now outside the for loop I should return all three lists. In the main program I will use this function and will assign the value to three lists for example X, Y and Z. Now I will print the result inside the list x, y and z. Let's run the code. Now I will enter the blank and we have the result. These are the values which are less than the mean value. Then we don't have any value equal to the mean value and only one value which is greater than mean value. Now the next task says that we have to create a function that will have one integer as the input argument and this function will return a list containing all factors of the input integer. Now in this case the input argument will be an integer and the output argument will be a list. We did this task previously but without creating a user defined function but I think it's not difficult and you should do it very easily. I will move to the next task. It says that you have to create a user defined function named as is sorted. It will have one input argument as a list and this function will determine if that list is in the sorted order or not. So the output of this function will be true or false. If the input list is sorted, the function would return true and if the list is not sorted, the function would return false. Let's do it over here. In main program I can have a list. You can see list is sorted. Now let's create a function. The input argument x is supposed to be a list. To see if it is a sorted or not, maybe I could have a logic that I can scan all elements inside the list and I should check if every next element inside the list is actually greater than the previous element. But there can be a very simple way because we have built-in functions available to sort a list. There is a function inside the list class named as sort and then there is a built-in function of the python named as sorted. So what I can do is I can sort the input list and then I can see if the new sorted list is same as the input list or not. So if it is same it means that originally the list was already sorted and if it is different then it means the originally list was not sorted. So should I use the list class sort method or built-in python sorted method. I have to compare the sorted list with the original list so I want to keep the original list as it is and it means I should not use the sort method of the list class because that method changes the original list. So I will use the python sorted method and I will save the result in some variable for example y and then simply I can check if y is equal to x or not. If it is I should return true and if not I should return false. 
Now let's apply this method on list A in the main program. You can see the output is correct, that list is sorted. Let's change this 38 to 380 and now the list is not sorted because 380 is greater than 90 and you can see the result is correct again. Now I will do this task number 4. It says that we have to create a function named as best of 2. This function will have two lists as the input argument with the assumption that both will have same number of elements and as the output it will generate another list which will be having the greater values on the corresponding indices of both of the lists. For example, if the input argument are these two lists, then this will be the output list which you can verify is having the greater value on the corresponding indices of the both lists. Let's see that over here. In main program, I will have another list. Both lists have 5 elements and as the output, I want a list which will have the first element as 3 because list A has first element as 2 and list B has the first element as 3 and bigger value is 3. Then the second element is 4 in list A and 7 in list B. So it should be 7 on the output list and so on the other elements. Let's create the function x and y are supposed to be two lists. Now I can start with an empty list which will be the output list. Now I have to iterate the elements of list x and y simultaneously because I have to check the corresponding elements so I should access the index of those elements instead of the elements itself. Now inside the range function, I will specify the length of the input argument list either x or y because we have the assumption that both of the lists are of same length. Now i will be the index so I should check if the element inside the list x at index number i is greater than the element in the list y on the same index i then it means the element in list x is bigger so I should append that into the list z. And else of course means the element in list y is greater than the element in list x so I should append the element of list y into the list z. And finally I will return the list z. Let's apply the function in the main program. and we have the desired result. Now in this task number 5, it is mentioned that we have a function named as count in list class which returns the count of an element inside the list. But in this task you have to create a function named as count range which will be used to count the number of values inside the list which are within some specific range. So for this function there will be three input arguments. The first will be the list in which we want to count the elements and then the other two will be the limits of the range. The output argument will be the count of those values. I think it is simple and you should do it easily. Now the last task is task number 6 and this is the review question for you which you have to answer in the comments. Let me explain the task. In our general language, when we have to write down few items, the grammar says that we have to write those separated by a comma and there should be AND before the last item. For example, if I am writing different programming languages, if it is just the one language, for example Python, I can simply write that. But if there are two languages I want to write, for example Python and Java, so there should be AND in between the two. And if there are three languages I want to write, Python, Java and C, then there should be comma after the Python, then a space, and then the second language, then a space again, then AND, then space, and then C. And similarly, if these are the four languages, there will be two commas, because now we have four items, and this will be the format. So the task is that you have to create a function named as display list. This function will have one input argument as a list and this function will return one string. That string should be the representation of all items of the list as the format we discussed. So if this is the list having the name of five fruits inside it and if I apply the function on this list, it will return a string and when printed, it should be displayed like this. Remember you are not supposed to print the result inside the function. You should simply return the string from the function. Then in the main program you have to print the result. If there are only two elements in the list, then this will be the output. So that's all from this lesson. Thanks for watching.